So now we're going to make this system bootable. And first thing we've got to do is create a FS tab file and this will list all the partitions that need to be loaded. So we need to refer to the disk layout. So if we do <coughs> excuse me, F disk minus L slash dev, dev slash STA. Just to remind us that what partitions we've got, we've got the boot partition on STA7. <coughs> We've got the swap on 8 and the main route on 9. So we need to modify this file to reflect those partitions. So the first line is for the route. So that was dev sda 9. And the type was ext4. Then it's got a swap here, which was the one prior to that, which was sta8. And then we need to add one in for the boot, which is sda7. Gets mounted on full slash boot. It was formatted to ext4. And defaults would be sufficient options. And I think the dump would be zero and the order would be two, I think, off the top of my head. Um, oh no, dump should be one actually. The order is two, and that should be it for that file. Oh, there's a bit here about um, with X3 file systems to make it reliable across power failures with some disk types to run HD Palm, and that's not actually part of the basic LFS installation. Um, so it's part of BLFS, you'd have to go there and install that first to find out if it's got native command queuing. Um, and you'd have to add this barrier equals one as one of the options in the um, FS tab file. So we won't be doing that, we don't need that. So I'll carry on. And now we can install the kernel. So let's go back to the sources directory and start extracting Linux. Okay, that's extracted. And the first thing to do, it says, is to make sure that we've got a clean source tree to start from. As it says here in this note, a good place to start is using make def config and is if you haven't got a config that you could use, that is a good place to start. It doesn't create the smallest kernel, but it creates a kernel that most of the time should run anywhere. So it's created that, it's created a config file. So if we now go into make menu config to check that this these options have been set or need to be set. So we look for device drivers on the top level menu, which is down here. Press enter. Then look for generic driver options. So just scroll down. Uh, somewhere along here. I've missed it. Let's go at the top again. Oh, there it is. Uh, generic driver options, fifth one down. Press enter to go into that. And we've got to make sure that support for uvent helper is unchecked, which it is. And that maintainer dev tempfs file system bounds at dev 
is checked and it is if it wasn't for some reason you just press space bar and it will cycle through the available options there's only two options here if it was an option to build a module for example this one here with the little angular brackets when you cycle through it goes to M instead an alternative way is you can press uh, yes I've pressed yes on a module but it says it can only be configured as a module so it won't let me do that and it's changed it to an M so with the modular ones you can do M to set it or space to clear it M to set it for space to clear it these ones you can do a, a Y or a no to clear it so a Y puts a star in and a no takes it off I tend to find it's easier just to stick with the space bar to toggle them rather than trying to remember what other buttons to press so that's it for that section so we just do exit twice to get back to the top level menu and then we need to go down to another option under kernel hacking which is the last option press enter there and we need to find an option that says choose kernel unwinder frame pointer unwinder so let's see if we can find that one Uh, missed that one again. Choose kernel unwinder. Right, now it could be that they haven't updated the description here and it's actually changed. So, what we can do is we can highlight this and search for it by pressing forward slash pasting that's the config name for this option in the kernel we can look for it so you can see it's, it is under kernel hacking but it's also under a directory called x86 debugging and then there's that our option choose kernel unwinder so we need to look for a menu called x86 debugging and there it is just above so we need to go down into that one and now we can look for choose kernel unwinder and there it is at the bottom and it's set currently to orc unwinder so we need to press enter there and change it to the bottom option frame pointer unwinder by pressing the space bar and you can see it's now changed so let's do exit and exit again and exit and we'll do yes to save those changes um, there's a bit about UEFI I'm not going to do that at the moment um, so we'll just skip past that and you can see it's told us here to use make menu config to make these changes so we're happy we've done the changes that we have to do we can just run make now to compile the kernel in fact I'm going to run make minus j4 to use all the cores
Okay, so that kernel has built. Um, I'm not sure if the modules were enabled, I presume they were, so we can try and install them with this command. Yes, they were, so that's okay. Um, if the host system is a separate boot partition, the files copy below should go there. The easiest way to do this is to bind the boot on the host outside the troop to mount an FS boot before proceeding as the root in the host system. Right, okay, so we need to do this. So this is the host system now, not inside the troot. And we need to bind. Oh no, sorry, no, that is wrong. <clears throat> it's not a separate boot partition. We're using our own boot partition. This would be if we're sharing, for example, two Linuxes on the same machine and we wanted to just have one boot partition. So we don't need to do that. Um, so now we need to copy the kernel image into the boot partition and just remember, we'll check this, that boot is already mounted, which it is, inside this troot. So that's where we just copied it. There's the kernel, VM Linux, and copy the system map file there as well. And we'll create a copy of the config file as well for future reference. And lastly, we'll install some documentation. Um, if the it says if the kernel source tree is going to be retained, which I recommend is a good idea to do, to run chone 0, 0 on the Linux 555 directory. So we'll do that. Um, just to ensure that everything's owned by root. So if we do a list, you can see everything's owned by root now rather than whoever packaged up the kernel or whatever machine did. Couple of warnings there. Just to bear in mind, not, nothing to worry about if you're following the, the instructions. Configuring Linux module load order, we don't need to worry about that at the moment. And now we're going to configure Grub to set up the boot process. Now, they've got instructions here for creating a bootable CD or bootable device. Um, I've never really seen the point of this as... Um, I've always built Linux from scratch from a live CD or DVD or USB. Um, if you do need to come back to uh, rescue the system that's not booting, you know, you made a configuration that's incorrect, you can just reboot from uh, whatever device you booted from before. So, for example, if I find this doesn't work for some reason, I've done one of the settings wrong, I'll just boot this Debian USB key up again, USB device and just load it all up again so it's not really necessary um, but, but you know if you fancy having that at hand you know, by, all means do, you know, by all means do that what we need to do here is to fetch some extra packages so let's go back into the sources um, and the first one we need to fetch is called EFI vars. So if we type that in EFI vars, um, let's type source. Um, I think. This first link is the one we want. Yes, this is GitHub. Uh, we need to find out where we can download a package. Um, clone or download. Is that the one? Pull request action security and science. Um, 
Somewhere in here you can download a version rather than the latest. Yeah, it's definitely the latest one. Um, yeah, that's what I was just looking for. Branch release, 47 releases is what releases, right. Yeah, EF5, EF5Rs, 37. So, yeah, this is the file we want to download here. So, um, let's download that. And we're going to save it. And we'll have to move this file from its download location which is in downloads so we'll have to do that on the host system and move it into LFS sources so into that directory there so move from home users or user downloads and it should be there if I, if I var into that location so we go back to the truth what we need to do here is to now extract it. CD into that package. And we need to do a couple of commands. Make libdir equals forward slash user forward slash lib. Right, now I've seen this before. Um, I seem to remember there's... Uh, let me just get a book out. I've got some notes here, I think, to make some changes to that file to get rid of that error. One thing we should do actually before we carry on there is to modify the kernel to allow us to use um, the EFI. So let's go into Linux, make menu, config, and modify a couple of options um, in. Partition types. Yeah, in enable block layer, go into there. You need to go down to partition types and select that. And then we want to ensure advanced partition selection is selected, which it is. And EFI GUID partition support, which is already selected as well, so that's okay. We need to come out of that. And then we need to go into file systems. And we need to ensure that uh, which one of these miscellaneous is it? Right. Our DOS FAT NT file systems. Yeah, MS DOS and VFAT are already selected. They're the two that we needed, so that's okay. Um, and lastly, native language support, and it's going to there and ensure that um, NLS, yeah, this NLS ISO 88591 Latin one is selected, which it is as well, so that's okay. So we now need to rebuild the kernel, so we just do make again, and it will rebuild the bits that are necessary to be built. So let's just go back one and rerun these commands to copy the to make the modules into copies of the kernel. OK. 
Okay, so reinstall any new modules that may have been created and then we'll recopy our new kernel image. Do you want to overwrite it? Yes. System map, yes. And the config file. Yes, we want, do want to overwrite it. Don't need to copy the documentation again, that hasn't changed. Okay. So let's go back to our EFI vars and I'll just look again to see if I can find this other modification. Oh, I've just seen there's another in my notes, there's another kernel setting that needs to be unchecked. Uh, processor type and features. We need to go into processor type and features and disable EFI mix mode. Support. So disable EFI mix mode support. So we remove that by pressing space. Okay. That should be it. So we need to unfortunately rebuild everything again. So do make again. Once again, we'll just rerun these commands. Just to overwrite the older files with the new updated kernel files that we've just created. Uh, yes. Okay. Right, so once again, let's go back to the sources. Um, right, yes, here it is. So um, there's one other thing we need to do is to create an EFI directory in boot. And we need to mount the EFI partition, which is where Windows, uh, the EFI for Windows already is. So if we do um, fdisk minus L on, sorry slash dev slash sda you'll see we've got this EFI system here that's the one we need to mount at boot EFI the directory we just created that directory there so we need to mount that partition on that directory so we do mount partition name onto slash boot slash EFI and we can actually look to see what's in there now and you'll see there's an EFI directory inside that and you can see there's a boot directory, a Dell and a Microsoft and each one of them will have their own um, EFI files for booting So 
So what we should do is create one for our own use. So make the slash ef uh, slash boot slash efi efi. You can see that's where all the manufacturers' names are. We'll call this LFS nine. In fact, I'll just call it LFS. That's enough. So we know that's where we need to install it. And now we can carry on modifying this EFI vars to um, prevent this failure. So if we edit the GCC specs file, there's a line here where it's got this this flag here says treat all warnings as errors. So if we remove that it means that the warnings we're getting before won't be treated as errors and the compiler will carry on as it was. So we can now do uh, recall the command we used to build this which was make make not that one it was that one I've just missed. Let's try again. Make lib the no. make lib. It's that command there. Make lib the equal four slash user four slash lib. So now it should run, and it has done. Okay, that's built successfully, so now we can install it. And that's worked fine. So the next file we need to get hold of is something called popt. So I put that in popt source. And you can see it's built as part of Beyond Linux from scratch, which is probably where I've got my instructions for for building it. So um, we could actually snatch that. In fact, let's stick with the read on nine, the latest version. Um, and if we control F here and look for pop T, there it is. We can just follow these instructions. So we can download it. Oh, that's not there. Let's try the other link. And save it. Once again, in the host, we can move that file from the download directory into the sources directory, go back to the truth environment and extract the package, change into it, and we can just follow these commands here. So let's do these separately. Build it. We can also check this as well. Just being careful not to catch that full stop at the end. That passed. We can install it. Don't need API documentation, so we'll ignore that. Um, and the last package we need to install to get this EFI booting working is a package called EFI boot manager. Again, it's on GitHub. Um, 37 releases. EFI boot manager 16. Let's download the tarball. Save it. And once again, go back to the host and copy that file 
into the sources directory. And remember, the reason why we're going back to the host is because we haven't got an easy way of downloading these files. Although we would have capability to do it via FTP, but that's another story. So let's come out of this, remove POPT, and now we can extract EFI Boot Manager, change into it, and we can run some commands here, quite lengthy commands, but too bad. So we just need to know that we've got our EFI, EFI LFS directory with nothing in it. So all we need to do here is make EFI the equals and the location of uh, I'm just gonna do help on that just to double check oh there is no help if I do Right, I think that EFI dir it wants is the root. So we just put boot EFI. Oops, equals. Oh, and there might be another one. What's this say? Oh no, it's not that one then. It is this boot EFI? Oh no, it still doesn't like EFI. It's the partition subdirectory name. Reserved. Okay. Is it LFS then? No, it's not. Why isn't this working? Ah, oh, it should be in capitals. EFI dirt should be in capitals. And should be set like that. That's better. So I don't know if it's put anything in there. No. Uh no it doesn't look like it has. It just needs to know where it is. So now we need to do an install minus V minus capital D minus M zero seven five five SRC slash EFI boot manager space forward slash user S bin EFI boot MGR and install minus V minus capital D minus M zero six four four SRC slash EFI boot MGR dot eight space four slash user share man then eight EFI boot MGR dot eight 
So what that's done is installed a binary and a man page for EFI Boot Manager. So we can actually run that to make sure it works. Um, EFI Boot Manager. Now you can see the current um, boot uh, sequences it knows. So it knows that there's the boot manager for Windows. There's one for Gen 2 because I've had Gen 2 running on here. There's another entry for Windows Boot Manager, don't know why. And then there's this other one here that we've booted from, which is where the Debian is running from. <coughs> so next we need to edit the ETC FS tab and add some lines to this. So do that at the bottom here. And we need to add slash dev slash SDA1 because that's the partition that's got the EFI partition on. And we need to specify where that is mounted. So that's mounted at boot EFI like we've done at the moment. It's a VFAT type. And we can add defaults as the option. And dump order zero, and uh, we can make that a one, I think. And then we've got one called EFI vars, which gets mounted at sys firmware slash EFI slash EFI vars. And the type is EFI vars and defaults and zero and one again. And that should be it for that setting there. So now we should be able to, um, or we need to reinstall Grub. So let's get rid of this EFI boot manager and extract Grub. And the reason why we need to rebuild this is to build the EFI stuff into it. Uh, sorry, CD Grub. So we need to configure it with prefix equals forward slash USR minus minus sbin uh, equals forward slash sbin minus minus sys conf der equals forward slash etc minus minus disable dash efi EMU, so similar options to the one we set in the kernel. Minus minus disable W error. Again, similar to what we did before, disabling errors on warnings. And more importantly, with platform equals EFI. Just gonna back go back here and get the grub page up. So it says it'll be compiled with the following options. So we've got EFI support for 64 bit, that's good. Um, it's found LLZMA for exa compressed MIPS images. I'm not sure if that's absolutely necessary to know or not. But the important thing, the platform has been detected, so we can now make this.
Okay, so let's um, reinstall this now. That's probably not necessary, but just complete this will do this move again. So that should be complete. So, um, what we need to do now is we'll go back to where we were with the install and grub and we do something slightly differently now. We do grub installed, but it's a slightly different command and hope it works too. Um, we have to tell it bootloader ID. is going to be LFS and a command called recheck and a debug option as well and we're going to send that to a log file called grub.log and it's not worked. I didn't send it to the. Oh, well, I did a ampersand, didn't I? But it's it's done the job. It's created a a boot option for LFS. We can see there, so it has actually worked. Although at the moment uh, the current boot is double OD, so we would need to set this up to boot LFS at the next boot. Um, I believe we can do that with that EFI boot MGR. Um, what we need to do here is set boot next. So we're doing, we're modifying uh, this option here, boot next minus n, and the four digit number. So the four digit number for LFS is double zero two. So we do boot next double o o two, and you can see the current boot number partition number is D. The next one will be two, but we can override this from the F twelve or F eight. Um, option when the machine's booting anyway, but this just makes it automatic for us. So now that's done, we can carry on um, with the build. Let me just look at this log file I created. Yeah, it's empty. Let's get rid of that. Uh, grub dot log. So we need to generate a config file. Let's just check our boot directory. So you can see it's created a grub directory there. Let's look inside the EFI partition. And there's our LFS we created. Let's look inside that and you can see it's copied Grub's copied its own EFI binary file there, so that's the one that it will use to, to boot this machine. So we can now add this in, and we can just modify this to because our partitions are different. If we just list the partitions again, f disk minus l slash dev slash sda. Remember our boot root part sorry root partition is nine and the root the boot partition where the kernel is is seven so we need to just remember that just bear that in mind and we'll edit uh, now this file that we just created so the root is the um, let me 
get this right. This is the root of the boot partition. So this is 7. This should be in here. And because we've got a separate boot, we don't need to specify a boot partition because because we've set this partition, this file is directly in that partition. It hasn't been mounted in boot or anything. So that's why we can just specify the kernel at the root. And then we need to tell the kernel that the root of the file system is at partition 9. So that should be all we need to set there. And we've finally come to the end. So one last touch here is to just update some references to indicate what's been installed here, what distribution's been installed. So the first one is to record which LFS version we've got installed. And then the next couple are just some like information about the system for compatibility reasons. So we'll copy the first one in, then we'll edit it, tweak it to our needs. So the distribution ID is Linux from scratch, it's version 9.1. Code name, put your name here. So for example, I'll put in kernel text. And distribution, description, Linux from scratch, that's fine. And same for the next ones used by systemd and some graphical desktop environments. So I'll create that one as well. And we'll edit it. So again, we've got a name Linux from scratch version 9.1 IDLFS. Pretty name Linux from scratch 9.1. Code name. Put your name in there. So let's get rid of that. Insert. And we'll put in kernel text. get counted, you can count yourself as a Linux from scratch user and now we get ready to reboot the system it warns us here that if we want to go onto BLFS, which we will be doing that it's going to be rather difficult because there's no browser, there's no graphical installation um, various problems basically to get packages installed and for installing the packages in the way that we've been doing browsing with a graphical browser and copying commands across but that's not a problem um, for now just want to get this system up and running when we come to when, when I come to do BLFS I can show you how to get around all these problems so let's log out and unmount these file systems so I'm assuming should still be the case. We've still got LFS. We have let's unmount all these now. These should all work. They have. Let's do mount to see what's left still. Yeah, we've still got this uh, EFI partition mounted. So let's unmount that one. That should be you mount. Uh, boot needs to be unmounted and lastly as it says here the LFS system needs to be unmounted so right we need to come out of it because we're in it so just go back one try again it's still busy so we could be yeah we're on it here as well so just come out of it there and that's unmounted And it says like if there's any other ones we had installed to unmount them. Now to reboot the system, so that's a bit abrupt. Um, probably wouldn't want to do that normally like that. We can do it, and it'll just shut down the system completely. But I'm going to do it nice way. Just Control D out of these, Control D out of that one. Shut the browser down. Remember, bearing in mind everything here is going to be lost because we're on a, a live environment. Close all the tabs. Shut that down. 
and what I'm going to do is to shut down the computer completely and then I'll power it up and hopefully it will come come to life our new Linux from scratch 9.1 system That's interesting, looks like something's got stuck here. Oh, it's just taking its time. <laughs> 